Well, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm excited I've got proper guests. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, like serious, heavyweight, proper. <laughs> yeah, I know, sorry, guy. But I mean, for those of you who don't know, which will be none of you, this is Henry Naylor. He used to be part of a reasonably OK double act. Some critics said it was a rather good double act, Kate. Did they, did Unfortunately, they really? not did you. <laughs> I, would, I would agree. I saw that. I saw you. And, years ago. and, and now he's, he, he's like a multi-award winning international... He's like a very tall, thin, posh Dave Johns in that he's taking <laughs> drama by storm and have been for ages. And this is Guy Masters, the, the Guy Masterson, who, how many years have you been coming? This to? is my 20th, it would have been 28th, but for COVID, 27. 27 Consecutive. years. Many years, you know, man I and comic. Close, yeah. uh, well, I came in 1985 in a school play. So <gasps> I've been here, which was <laughs> awful. There was literally really? one man and their dog in the audience. It was right. crazy. There's more people but on that, the stage. That was, that was always one of the, the, the tales that the mm. average fringe audience was four people. Mm. Mm. And, you know, now you've got Self-obsessed comics wanting to throttle their professional PRs if they don't sell out every night. Mm. But enough of comics. We're talking. <laughs> I, I was thinking, which I do sometimes, and then I get a headache. And pfft. but while I was thinking, I was thinking that, and it was largely you. And then I talked to Guy about Twelve Angry Men and whatnot. The comics do seem to make phenomenal actors. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and with, with, you know, no training and hanging around at the academy pretending to be a tree or something. <laughs> and I, I, my uh, thoughts were that it was maybe something to do with, you, you have to be honest to be a stand-up comic. It's the, it's the truth in it and it's the direct relationship with an audience that seems to help give a, a, a kind of veracity to a performance even when there's a script. Mm. Discuss. Well, I, but stand-up is acting. I mean, sort of, it's such an unnatural situation. A good stand-up will make it look like it's having a chat with an audience. Mm. But it's obviously such an unnatural thing. You wouldn't stand up in a pub full of people and talk, wouldn't talk about you, your grandma. Wouldn't you? Well, well you I wouldn't improvise a joke that you expected to work. You'd, you'd perfect, perfect that joke yeah. before you told it, right? Yeah. Just the same way as an actor does. Yeah, and the, the um, I suppose, a double act, because there's a definite dynamic in a double act that is very different from the way a single stand up. It's just him, his microphone, his ego and varying amounts of talent. But I, I mean, I think that's, that's true. And also, I think what it teaches you is, when a double act is to really listen to the other person. And particularly in a sort of stand-up scenario, when you might be getting heckled and you might have to suddenly change the order of your script or, or change the order of things, you need to really understand the other person on the stage. And I think, so sketch performers and double acts, I think, are very good in, in ensemble pieces yeah. because they they learn how to respond. In, in 12 Angry Men, for example. That's what I was just going to ask about. Yeah. Was the, there must be a tendency when you're working with uh, 12 of the top, you know, comics, that they would, what Henry was just saying about, oh, this bit isn't going very well, I'll just change it around a bit. But wait, obviously, well, they knew they couldn't do that. But, I mean, some of those, some of those actors had trained. I mean, Phil was trained at the Royal Scottish, Phil Nicholl. And um, Bill Bailey had trained in, in Middlesex. Yeah, you're uh, spoiling my theory now. But, um, no, but God. let me tell you the theory. We hired <laughs> these guys, and some of them were known as improvisers, and others were known as straight stand-up jo jokesters and storytellers, like Owen O'Neill. And when we, did the, uh, we, when we did the 12 Angry Men on tour in Australia and New Zealand, we did these galas, comedy galas, on the Saturday and Sunday mm. nights. But we broke them up into two. We did the improvising on the Sunday, and we did the stand-up comedy on the Saturday. And near the twain met. And uh, Boothby Griffo did the uh, um, did, did the, uh, uh, the comparing, but what I was what I watched as a director, I was watching people do exactly the same every night. The jokes were the same, and they were delivered exactly the yep. same. 
same inflection, same look to the right, same picking up of the audience. It was all the same. Even the improvisers, they managed to wangle it round to the same, yeah. the same jokes. And, uh, and I thought, there is no difference. It's uh -huh. exactly the same. What made you think that, uh, or who made you think that uh, 12 top comics on one stage could possibly work together and well, not just kill one another. Well, we all thought it was. We, 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 we just did it for fun anyway, because we... Shits it, and giggles. It, well, we did it in the assembly room bar. It was like uh, Owen Neil and I had stayed up in the middle of the night once uh, in different apartments and said, did, people you watch talk, yeah. did you watch 12? Did you watch 12 Angry Men? It's my favourite film. So we were, we were surrounded by comics, so we just said, oh, that's my favourite film, and Bill was there, and and Omid was there, and and, uh, and Greg Proops, and everybody wanted to do 12 Angry Men, just, to, just for the love of it. Uh -huh. I said, if you're going to do it, we're going to take it seriously. So they all agreed, and we could have cast it in the assembly bar twice over, three times over, with comics who wanted to be in it. And they were all grabbing the best jurors for themselves. Yeah. I want to do jury number three. No, yeah. that's gone. <laughs> do jury number six. And, uh, and Dave Johns, who's now a big movie star, yeah. film star. A film star, he, yes. He wasn't in that original group. He wasn't up that year. But it was just so many comics yep. dropped out. Some because they got busy and others yep. because they, uh, they, 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 they were scared. They were literally scared of working on stage with other comedians, not knowing how the dynamic was going to work. Really? Gonna tell you who was dropped. scared? Come on, I'm not going to tell you who it was. Oh, God. I can't do that. I can't do that. But we ended up with uh, we, what I would call almost um, a skeleton cast. And if we didn't have Bill, we wouldn't have been able to do the show because Bill was the only super high profile comedian in the group oh. at the time. We had a couple of, um, of, of Perry Award nominees with Owen and Phil Neil. And and Phil. Phil hadn't been nominated. Oh, we had no. Point. But um, Jeff Green yeah. and, uh, and, and all of that. And, but but you, if it wasn't for Bill, we wouldn't... Were you asked at all to be in the... I wasn't. I was too shit, Kate. Oh. You read your reviews. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> you read her reviews of me too, right? <laughs> um, yes, what was it I gave a terrible review to one year? Yeah, your favourite book. And she came oh. up to me and said, I'm reviewing your show tomorrow. I hope it's not you don't fuck it up. Am I allowed to say You're that? You're allowed to say that, I hope yes. you don't fuck it up. And uh, then she told me she, uh, that I fucked it up. And she gave me two stars. I lost a Could fortune. Could be one. <laughs> exactly. It wasn't, you, it wasn't the interpretation of the play she wanted. No, I know, I know. But you, you can't help with that. So what? Because you, you didn't go from uh, being uh, Andy Parsons' straight man <laughs> <laughs> to um, kind of comedy. You went, you pretty much plunged straight into yeah. serious shit. Mm. I know, okay. I, I, a part of the reason uh, was, I mean, I, I wanted to do something which was quite hard hitting because I, I was getting into political satire at the time. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I wanted to write something a bit weighty. And that, I mean, I, and I'm, t I'm basically in the show I'm doing at the moment, I talk about how I got into doing playwriting. Oh. It, it's, it's the story of, of me going to Afghanistan to research yep. my, uh, my first play, which is called Finding Bin Laden. Uh, and uh, I got out there because my best friend was a war correspondent and I was watching this report on the news and uh, he got blown up live on air. It was fine, but the studio wall got blown up. Wow. And I was already beginning to get this idea for a play. Yeah. It was all in the time of Afghanistan. And I said, um, I said, look, you know, can you just check my script and tell me if it's factually accurate? And because he's a journalist, he said, I, 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 can't, I can't do that, you know, I've, I'm believing the truth. But he said, if you want to check it, I'll get you out there. Mm. And so he introduced me to the BBC fixers, and I went with this brilliant photographer, I used to work for the Scotsman, called Sam Maynard. Oh, yeah. He went Scottish Feature Photographer of the Year, and, you know, he's just up for an adventure, and I told him I was going to do this. He said, oh, I'll come with you. And, and so we went together, and oh. he got these photos from the wars, and it was straight after the war. And it, and it literally changed my life, Kate, because like, I kind of went from, from actually being involved in a news story is very different from sitting at home yeah. sneering at the yeah. news on your laptop. Mm -hmm. And then when you sort of see the effect of, of a war yeah. on real people, you think, God, my jokes have got a, a moral responsibility yeah. here, yeah. You, you know, and it, and it, it yeah. basically made me grow up, I think. That's a really uh, interesting look. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a, in all, maybe it's just because I'm now, you know, unfeasibly old, but in pretty much, I don't think there is any area in which actually being there on the ground, understanding 
what, how it goes mm. it is not an improvement. Mm. Uh, it's, and it, it was one of the things that... Because all I ever wanted to be when I was little was an actress. Mm. And I thought, because I can be other people, I can be anybody. Mm. But now, you go, well... Can I, it's, this is an interesting point. In 1998, uh, the year that we extended the fringe by a week, which killed everybody. I love everybody. the way you say you are. Yes, yes. Very, very, very well. <laughs> and uh, um, it's the one vowel which has stuck with me <laughs> in living in London. But um, uh, I did a show say about a soldier. Again. Yeah. <laughs> I did, a, I did a, a play about a soldier called A Soldier's Song, written by a paratrooper who'd written a best, best-selling book called A Soldier's Song. And I'd done the adaptation. And on at the Traverse at the same time was a play called Soldiers, which were real soldiers, people who'd been in war zones, yes. telling their own stories. Yes. And uh, it, was, it was a big thing, and the, and the BBC wanted to do a comparison. So uh, with a, a, a neutral um, uh, war correspondent, a neutral war correspondent who said, what is more realistic? Is it an actor playing a soldier and telling the soldier's story, or is it real people telling their real stories? Ultimately, plumped with the actor. And it may have been in this particular case that the, 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 the soldiers who were telling their stories, although true, uh, weren't, weren't able to... The mm. theatricality of the piece didn't convey as well. Mm -hmm. However, ten years later, I put the same show on with the soldier who had written the book, who did my adaptations. And that took it to an even more mm. profound place because he was saying his own words in a theatrical way with the sound effects and all of that kind of thing. He refused to use the, sh the machine gun that I used, that was my prop, the real submachine gun that I held. He refused yeah. to use it because he didn't want to hold a gun again, having been in war. Mm. So he walked around as if he was holding it with his finger on the trigger, and it was as if you, you could see the gun yeah. in his hand. But, uh, and that was a true, real mix of those two, those two uh, yes. experiences. I mean, do you, because they all of, you're loving your socks. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just ever so slightly distracted. I thought she no. was looking at mine. <laughs> nah, these are amazing. Um, do, do you ever get an urge? Well, I mean, I'm assuming if, if you are telling your story in, in uh, this year's show, this year's play, um, there will be humour there. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's sort of... Uh, uh, there's lots of jokes in it, but it's, it's definitely a play. Yes. But, there's a, you know, you hit those beats of drama, you yep. take your audience on an emotional journey, you've got your four acts, you've got your sort of... Yeah. You hit your beats. But, um, but no, I, it, it's one of those things as well, OK? I mean, sort of... And, 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 you know, I'm interested to chat to you, to you about this as, uh, as well, because, like... There are, uh, the reason why I'm doing this this year is because of what happened in Afghanistan yes. exactly a year yes. ago. Mm. Yes. Uh, and there's people I know out there, my fixer, who's a great guy, mm. who started working for the UN mm. after to, to us. He worked for the UNHCR. Um, and uh, he's on the run from the Taliban mm. because, like, not only did he assist Westerners, but he, um, he's... Uh, you, you, you know, he worked for women's rights. Mm. So, so I've been in correspondence with him yeah. saying, can we get you out? What yeah. can we do? And, and so, like, the government's useless. Mm. Yes. The only, yeah. the only people seem to be helping, uh, the Germans seem to be quite good. But he was going to get out. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, um, and then the Ukraine happened, and suddenly all Germany's resources were directed over there, so mm. we're still trapped in that. And it's, it, one of the reasons that I think uh, it, the governments will always be useless is because they're up here. And it's back to that thing, mm. you don't... You can't understand mm. or feel or... Uh, the big picture, I think, in almost everything, is wildly overrated. Yeah. You can see bugger all in the big picture. And also, you feel bugger all in the big picture because it's all just tiny. You go, oh yes, a bomb was dropped here. But if you were there... This is... But you are getting into the essence of what an actor does. You know, how can anybody play Hamlet, for example, if they've never been a, a, a prince and their father hasn't been murdered? Mm. And, you know, but th that is what acting is. It's, a, it's about an empathetic through line. And the, uh, and, and what it's make makes... believe, though, isn't it? It's just it's, make believe. It's not quite make believe because what you're saying. Well, if saying it doesn't make having... me believe, it's not very good acting. But that's true. But I said it's not just. But what you're saying is that having been there, it's given you a core of empathy that you're able to draw on, which gives yeah. you a veracity on stage. Yeah. But the, the, the stronger the actor, the more empathetic, empath, 
empathetically he can perform, or she, of course, or they, they can inhabit... You couldn't be so careful. No, 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 no. <laughs> Everybody. The they, they, are, they, they are literally playing the through line. Now, in my play, Nine Circles, Nine yes. Circles, Nine Circles, yep. um, it is about a, a soldier who's been honourably discharged for an, a war atrocity. Mm -hmm. which they wanted to cover up. It's the true story of Stephen Dale Green, played by an actor. And it's about the descending into the nine circles of hell to find redemption for his horrific act. And, um, of course, he's, he is sentenced to execution, it's true, by George W., mm -hmm. because the weight of public opinion was against him for the atrocity. However, when you delve into the story, is there any empathy you can find for the soldier? And what this play does, it, it, it forces us to find some empathy. Now, if he couldn't empathize with the soldier's plight and the journey that he took, it would be just words yeah. in a room. But he is so effective about convincing you, A, that he's the soldier, two, that he was there, three, that the experiences which he's telling us about were his experiences. But that's what a good actor can do. But it, I, that's still make-believe and, well, and because if they haven't I'm not saying that you know you have to be a one-legged nun to play a one-legged nun yes. but um, there's a whole big argument oh, about that right huge now. huge terrifying um, I'm just waiting for a Hollywood blockbuster starring you know an embittered wrinkly sad old uh, Scottish woman <laughs> we just had a situation where we had a, 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 a spoof of, 11, uh, of, of 12 Angry Men which was going to come up to Edinburgh and we were warned that we shouldn't do it because we're going to have another 12 men on stage and maybe we should consider cross-casting. <gasps> and I'm going, wait a second, this is set, the play was set in 1957 and even though it's a spoof, um, do we, does that, what do you mean cross-casting? Do we need uh, uh, people to play gay, lesbian? 12 uh, premenstrual women. Uh, this isn't a war zone, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, even that's dangerous. I can't even say that. What, but but what, what I'm trying to say is that someone seriously asked us those questions. If we're doing a play about uh, set in 1957, when there were no women on an American jury, in, in a federal jury, uh, and we're expected to then cross, mm. cross cast, um, it, it, it poses some really interesting questions. What is the future of... Historical yeah. plays. Uh, oh, well, they, at the moment, I don't know if they have. Because, as George Orwell said, he who controls the past controls the present. Mm -hmm. So you just wipe out all things that we don't like now out of the past, mm -hmm. and you make people believe it's always been like that. And, you know, so the, it's... it's Difficult to rewrite history, but, but I completely no, understand it. about, you know... Sort of We've had a female doctor. <laughs> trying to... <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea that we can try to find uh, uh, cross-casting and... Uh, and uh, what's, what's the word? Um, genuine casting, that's not the word. Mm. Uh, authentic. Uh, authentic or, casting, yeah. mm. where, where it's possible. But there are some plays where you... I can't imagine it happening. Apparently Gregory Peck's agent, because he was always pretty much cast as Gregory Peck, he used to get scripts through the post with NAR written across the top. Yeah. No acting required. No, <laughs> <laughs> Michael Caine. Would... would you, assuming that uh, your show this year is a humongous success, it wins the usual number of awards that you owe. You just... They should just give you the award at the beginning of the fringe. Can you share it with me, please? <laughs> um, and supposing it, it, uh, it goes all over the world, um, but you test positive for COVID at the airport. It is your experience. It is your life. Yeah, no, I don't Who would you cast to play you? I don't think you could in this one. I think this one it is such a personal So you have story. to be Henry Naylor to play Henry Naylor? I think Henry I have Naylor. to. Uh, in this particular case, I think I do. I mean, sort of like... Because it, it is my personal experience. I, I, I think it would be compromised if it wouldn't, because, like, you, you know, there's things like going into refugee camps, seeing refugees, looking them in the eye. There is a... I, I, I wouldn't be able to act that truth. 
but I can do it on stage here because yes. I d direct experience. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm not a good enough actor. I'm sure, I mean, guys talking about quality actors, I'm not a quality actor. But you don't know if you're a quality actor. You've had awards, was... Henry. Yeah. You must be you're a quality actor. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't doubt that it could happen. You know, do, no, you but... know don't draw that line. <laughs> Owen O'Neill, who wrote yes. um, Off My oh. Face, you yeah. know, which was his personal experience about being off his face yeah. and ending up in Amsterdam, not knowing how. Brilliant solo <laughs> show. I called him famously Saint... Uh, What's his name? Owen. Saint Owen. <laughs> I called him Saint Owen in the in the in the Herald, um, and gave him this review when I was doing some writing. And um, uh, I've said to him, Owen, many many times to get another actor to play that part because it was such an important role mm -hmm. about alcoholism and mm -hmm. coming to terms with it. And of course, he's been dry ever since. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important play, but he can't play it now. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Uh, it's. Uh... There's a whole other discussion, more on this story later, um, <laughs> but just about all of that. Do you feel that your time as, as I say, uh, Andy Straight Man uh, <laughs> helped you to, in being an actor? I think, what, I think the difference between comics uh, as actors and actors as actors is the ability to do it I, and I'm intrigued to hear Guy's take on this yep. because, like, I, I don't know how he got comics to do the same lines yep. with the same truth for yep. months on end. I think so. What comics tend to be very good at is screen actors because they're, they're yep. very used to the one, living yeah. the moment. Yes. Um, yes. Mm. I, I, and I think sort of, I, I would find it difficult to do the same lines for six months. Yeah. Mm. And not get bored, and I, I think that's part of the joy of being a stand-up. It's sort of yeah. like you change your material, try new bits out. You try new bits out as you stood on stage. Yeah, the whole and thing you, about doing you pretty a play. much change. Sorry to interrupt. I'm not really sorry to interrupt because somebody's waving their arms at me, and we've got to. Uh, you got either we can either use the time for you to plug your show, or uh, you change the face. You certainly change the bank account <laughs> of drama at the fringe. It, yeah, doing, it was it, it, using it, comics. It, it was. It was not a new idea, and it certainly wasn't. Uh, 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 it's been done in London. Ray Cooney had a, a, a company of comedians, and that that went very, very well. But what was different about Twelve Angry Men was that a we did it for the love of it, purely for the love of it, and let's let's do it. But the rules were that you had to take it seriously, mm -hmm. and you had to deliver the lines, and you couldn't mess around. Mm -hmm. Not on stage, not with such an important play. Mm -hmm. They all agreed to that. They all because they loved the play. And the second thing was, um, uh, they would, the, the, um, what was the second thing? I mean, you had the combined pulling power yes. of all those big yes. name comics. Right. That was the thing. And it was the first time we'd had a huge drama on the fringe that had sold 680 seats a day for 25 performances. It was the first time. So it proved to the fringe that you could have a big drama. You could have big circus and you could have big gala comic nights and would fill out, but never was there a drama yeah. which could play for 26 performances and sell so many tickets. And then that snowballed, yep. and then Assembly had their big venue, and they went to yep. a bigger venue, and then the Pleasants had the big venue, the Grand, and then now we've got... You basically Hall. screwed the Fringe. Well, I don't think it has. That's why it's all become huge. I don't think it has. I, mean, I, think I don't think I'm more Henry's. <laughs> one, one, <laughs> be more Henry. But you know, this, this thing about bringing up big, big name comedians, does it hurt or hinder the fringe? We've got to, we've got to wrap. But yep. I think it helps because it brings people who otherwise wouldn't come to the fringe in and they might take in another show. Yeah, because but they, they won't take in another show. They might do. No, they won't. So. What, what are you doing? You're, <laughs> not, you're, not, you, you're not using uh, comics <laughs> this year, are you? Uh, well, I'm doing a comedy absurdist play in Horse Country, mm -hmm. which won all the awards in 2002, and that's going back on at Assembly this year. Uh, this and year. This year. <laughs> and Nine Circles, which is a real comedy about war atrocities, but uh, it is actually a brilliant, brilliant play and an important play, particularly this time, with what's going on. Oh, in, yeah. Uh, and both uh, in at Assembly. Both at Assembly Studio 2, George Square. Yeah. George Square Studio yeah. 2. Henry. I'm doing a show called Afghanistan is Not Funny. <laughs> uh, which right, is me. Okay, which yes. is me stood up on stage uh, talking uh, about my life and uh, how I got into playwriting and showing Sam Maynard's extraordinary photos. He took one out in Afghanistan and it's quite a lot happened. We nearly got killed three times, narrowly missed a landmine, we got abducted by the Mujahideen. 
Uh, and we got abused in Bagram Air Base by a uh, American colonel who later got put on trial for war crimes at the, uh, after uh, after um, uh, the Abu Ghraib stuff. Wow. So, uh, so uh, it was. It, 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 I'm not you'd those, be packing it, that all into an hour. Yeah, it's just, it was just one of those. It was, I was only there ten days, but it, everything Change happened. Yeah, and it was. Completely I naive. Can't wait to I, can't I know. Wait to me see. too. I mean, I'm obviously, your stuff's always brilliant, but I really <laughs> want to see that. Uh, which is on where and when? Uh, it's on at the Gilded Balloon at four o'clock. Brilliant. Thank you both very, 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 <laughs> very much. I want to talk more about one-legged nuns now. Bye. <laughs>